Yeah, we got about four minutes before we pull in Studio B. Okay, let me uh, figure this out. Three minutes. Four minutes. You still have four minutes. It's only 7:53. We need to pull them in at 7:57. Now three minutes. Okay. So uh, I made a page on uh, Korean radio. I put a bunch of links, a bunch of uh, links to different things we could chat about. Because I, mean, I was reading, you sent that one link, it had the discussion about memory and COVID, right? Working memory, I'd never heard the term. So I was just in the middle of reading it when you guys called. Yes, okay. And then I made a, a page full of lots of links, lots of um, things. That okay. On Aquarium Radio. All right. Com. Let's Yeah, it's tax day for me today. It's what? I had tax day for me today, and we couldn't get it to work. So now i got to mail my return to New York State, and they don't accept manual <laughs> returns. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. Taxation is theft. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, tax day. I sent mine in a long time ago. Okay, let's It's like you buy your piece. Okay, so if you look at um, uh, Korean radio, there is a show page. I've got to disconnect the other one from the other lady that did the show. So you see All right, let's see. <laughs> All right, let's see. Sacred Matrix links. Where's the links? Down below, there's lots of links. I, I put in two full, oh. article, full articles and then I just. Next to the Bobcats. So I, I went down and just added a bunch of stuff. Okay, so uh, we got one minute before pulling the studio, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So have you guys seen the movie, The Fourth Encounter, the new one about Nome, Alaska? No, did not. What's that about? No. Tell us about it. Do you guys know anything about that case? It's about missing people. They think it's E.T. Um, kidnappings. And there was a therapist who noticed um, similarities in cases of all the people she was counseling. And so when I researched the story... There was this information out there. We got to pull Studio B in. I'll tell you later. Let me do it now. Okay. But you can rap about that on the show. Okay, great. Because okay, great. I'm curious to know what you guys I'm curious think. curious to know what you guys think. Yeah, let's, let's kick it around on the show. Okay. Okay. I think great.
listening to Revolution Radio. Hi everybody, it's me, the Fed, host of Inside the Eye Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning stream media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fed, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Mr. Rowe, I am the host of Reality Extraction, the revolution radio at freedomslips.com. I utilize logic, intellect, and magic to methodically atomize, vivisect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday, 1700 hours Pacific Time, that's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's Reality Extraction with Mr. Rowe on Revolution Radio. Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together, we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio, Studio B, and we have a panel today, our three co-hosts, Janet Kara Lesson, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and Deborah DeFranco, and uh, let's see, I didn't get the bios in, so I'll have to add those later, but uh, we're going to kind of talk about the current events, what's going on in the news, what's going on in the media, uh, some... Uh, you know, different perspectives on different things. So, I'm just going to go around and let everybody do a mic check. Doctor, oh, and Deborah DeFranco is our producer. She's joined us as the new producer of our two shows on Revolution Radio, Sacred Matrix, and Stargate to the Cosmos. So, Doctor Sasha, are you there? Can you say hello and add anything that you want? Yes. To can, uh, can, can you hear me, Janet? Can, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, Janet. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Janet. I can hear you. Oh, wow. I can hear you, hey, you people out in uh, Radio Land, uh, shout back. Can you hear me? Louder, I can't hear you. Anyway, listen. Uh, I, I, what I've got to say about uh, what's going on today, it comes from my, I'm an anthropologist, I have a PhD in anthropology, and I can tell you now from the research that we've really gone into from real ancient work that we were black and white from the get-go, from the very beginning and I will go into it. There was a two sets of Adams and two sets of Eves that uh, our geneticists uh, uh, created us out of. And uh, we're gonna, uh, I'll have a chance to talk to you how that came about. 
out and uh, and also about the way this comes down into, you know, and one of the things these people ultimately did, they made us for slaves. And it's the legacy of slavery that we're dealing with all over the planet uh, today in the uh, Black Lives Matter. And I can tell you, it, you know, from the, the, our deep studies is that when, when a group is oppressed, that it's perfectly natural for them to feel anger. And if they turn that anger into a, a, a understanding, then it comes to effective action. And I think that's just where we are now. My studies lead me to conclude that the time has come for us to have a new age and that this was uh, presaged by our um, founders, uh, the Anunnaki. We'll talk about that. And this is it. It's coming about. It may seem tumultuous because it's a perturbation that shakes us all up. But in the end, it's going to be good. Well, I want to talk about the movie The Fourth Kind that's on Amazon Prime right now that is about um, a series of suspected alien abductions, ET abductions, um, in Nome, Alaska. Is that a new production so, or is that the one that was out a few years ago? I think I saw it. Was no. This is a brand new production that was made in 2020. That's a remake of the one a few years ago. Now, the difference in the one that they made this year is that it overlays real video from the case from the therapist that was doing the sessions with all the patients that were reporting very abnormal things going on in their lives. Several of them committed suicide and actually killed their families out of sheer terror for what they saw and the memories that they recalled and recovered. Now, this therapist actually videotaped these sessions, had other doctors come in. And so in the movie, because there's a lot of naysayers out there about this case, so in the movie they actually oh, they split screen and show the real video from the therapist records along with the artistic movie side by side so that – it, it's done to kill the doubts because there's a lot of misinformation out on the Internet about this case. Uh, if you can get that link and send it to me, I'll put it up on the show page. We have a show page on AquarianRadio.com. I don't know why people call when they know I'm on the radio. Okay. And um, Can I link the movie that's on It's on Amazon Prime. Is there a way to post that as a link? Oh, it's the fourth kind here. I'm going to yeah, pull it up. Card, you, cl you clicked on the movie, and, uh, and then you go up to, I'm not sure how you said it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm getting the old one. Unless they, no, they wouldn't have redone that. Yeah. No, this is a brand new one that was released in 2020. Okay. We will take care of these uh, technical things, uh, and uh, let's go on with the content right now, please. Okay. So, uh, anyway, so you're saying they overlaid the old, the original. Um... No. The, okay. The story is it's a therapist in Nome, Alaska. Nome, Alaska is an isolated city in Alaska, and the only way to get there is to fly in. There's no ferries, and there's no roads. There's about 3,000 people that live in this town. So this woman was living somewhere else and was coming to Alaska and doing therapy on a regular basis. And then she moved her kid, her, her family, her husband and her family moved up there to do some research. Her husband was initiating the research and he dies. She has a memory that he was murdered. But at the end of the movie, it shows something different. I don't want to give the movie away for anybody that hasn't watched it. Okay. Um, right? And what the, the police are implying is that she had a screened memory, that it wasn't the correct memory of what actually happened. Now, at the, it, it, in the movie, her daughter gets kidnapped. There's actually vi video, but it's very distorted because every time video of the ETs 
there's video of the ETs. They, there's interference. So it's not clear. So bits and pieces are coming through. But the doctor in all the sessions with her patients, when she started noting the similarities, she found the similarities in 300 people. So it wasn't just a few people. And they were all coming to her with the same symptoms and reporting seeing the same animal, an owl, which is often in the screened memories that the ETs leave, right? right. Mm-hmm. Now, her, her, they, her and her children get kidnapped. Her and her son get returned. The daughter doesn't get returned. And so these other doctors that are assisting her, they actually do a regression on her. And during the regression, they all get kidnapped and it's on video. Now, in these videos, she videotapes all of this. So they took the videotapes from her personal records and overlaid them with the movie shots. So you can see where there's similar, um, you know, similar scenes to the actual video, the actual events. So this isn't in relation to the old movie. It's in relation to the doctor's video files of these patients and of her meetings with the other doctors. Now, Sasha, you'll find this very interesting. In the video that was captured, they're speaking, the ETs are speaking ancient Sumerian. Now, right before her... Yes, right before her husband died, he reached out to a doctor... um, who had spent his career studying ancient Sumerian. And after her husband gets murdered, she realizes her memories may not be correct or she's not recalling everything. So she goes back to the scene of the murder to see if she can discover anything that will help her figure out what happened. She finds this doctor's number in a book that her husband was reading. And so she called the doctor. And so they started talking. The doctor immediately came to visit her. So there's real recordings of them talking, again, overlaid with the movie, uh, the movie version of it. So they'll do the split screen wherever they have a video from the doctor's records, similar to a, a scene in the movie. They split screen it so you can see that it matches the real event. Because there's, like I said, there's a lot of naysayers out there saying this didn't happen. At the end, they they don't bring you to a conclusion. They encourage you to develop your own conclusion, but they point out particular facts. After her case, the FBI, after her investigation, the FBI had con- has come to know. 250 times. Now, Anchorage, which is not too far investigating this. Now, Anchorage, which is not too far away, they have come to Anchorage 350 times. They will not explain why they've come and why they visit. At one point, she was brought up on charges for possibly being involved in her husband's murder and in her daughter's kidnapping. Now, her daughter has never come back. Now, on the tape, the ETs are talking in ancient Sumer where they said she's the daughter. They're going to keep her and never bring her back. Wow. But, it, wow. yeah, you've got to watch this movie. It's the new one. And I think because of all the people saying what happened in Nome isn't true and this and that, there are over two dozen people that lived in Nome that disappeared between 1967 and 2000 when this happened. And there's no trace of them anywhere. No traces of their disappearance, no traces of people being involved in it, nothing. And they've never returned. And no, they've not located the bodies. Now, the argument is this is a very remote part of Alaska. Um, it, you know, it's extraordinary. It, it's wild wilderness on a scale that none of us are used to and they say missing people is not unusual you know you can walk off into that forest and get lost and you'll never come out and people will never find you and they say that happens all the time but i find it unusual that over two dozen people went missing and there's no trace all ages all walks of life all different things like they would be on a person on an errand and never make it never show up and never come back again So I'm trying to do more research. There just wasn't a lot out there about the case. 
And like I said, when you look at the facts that they present, it's very, very hard not to believe what you're seeing. I found it, oh, and I put the link up on my Aquarian radio page for today's show. They've changed the name to Close Encounters of the Fifth Time. Contact has begun. And um, Dr. Stephen Greer and Daniel Sheehan, the... Um, no, that's not it. That's not the movie. They, these have, like, all-stars in it. Hold on. Oh, Let me see if I can get yeah, it real anyway, quick. We'll, we'll go on to so, something else. So, yeah. I found one with, uh, uh, okay, so this is a different one. Can't find the one you're talking about. It's still, uh, there's one up that's coming up that says Close Encounters of the third, or Fourth Kind, and this is Close Encounters of the Fifth Time, Fifth Time, Contact Has Begun. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll find it, and we'll put it up on AquarianRadio.com. Anything else you want to say on that? It's very, it sounds very interesting. I, I will definitely watch it, and we can do a follow-up report on it next week, um, you know, to see if we can find out more. Oh, you know what? You're right. It's called The Fourth Kind. It was made in 2008. I'm sorry. I don't know why I thought it was 2020. Okay, so that's... It's got Mila Jovovich. Jav- Will Patton, some very famous actors in this. Yeah, that I that one I saw when it was so, Go ahead, Sash. Well, Deborah, if you were going to uh, imagine what's behind all this and, and just in wild intuition or whatever, what do you think's happening in this case? I, I do believe that ETs are kidnapping people, but not for the reasons that people believe. Right. I believe they created us. Right. And they're concerned about what we're doing on this planet and what we're doing to ourselves. I mean, we have not been kind stewards of the planet and we have a lot of diseases and illnesses and COVID being one of them that we're causing because of our poor stewardship. Now, they're trying, I believe they're trying to make sure we're healthy. I also believe that they're using our DNA to repopulate other planets because I believe that's what the process is, right? You create a planet, you create an environment, you take species from similar planets or similar environments and try to adapt them to the new planet. I think seeding planets is something that has gone on for a very, very long time. And I say I believe it continues to go on. I believe the ETs are abducting people to make sure they're okay and to monitor our health and our DNA throughout the process of humanity existing on this planet. And I'll hand the baton off to you. Okay. What do you want to say, Sash? Um, um, wow. <laughs> um, uh, wait, wait, just a second. Uh, uh, do you fiddle for something while I ca- recover, we, recover my we, we are their people. I believe they're trying to monitor us and take care of us. Because if they wanted us, they could take us. If they've got the technology to do everything we believe they have, and we see that they their presence has been here thousands and thousands of years before the before human in this incarnation were here. So oh. they, obvi- they obviously yeah. have the technology to do things that are unimaginable to us. Right. So- uh, you know, you know, I, I, I got it. I got it. I got what I was trying to think of. I, the pro- I don't know if the researchers looked at what I would look at, which is what are the behaviors of these uh, people that were abducted. And my first fantasy was they took all the litter bugs uh, for littering in, in whatever level that was, all the polluters, <laughs> all, and that there was some, there was some that, that, these, that uh, these were people that either needed correction, or there might have been a multiplicity of causes, like uh, somebody's really fertile or they have red hair or something like that. <laughs> but, you, but, you know, it could, but uh, that was it. They could. Uh, what are the characteristics of those that uh, uh, were taken with the uh, critical data from my perspective? I agree, because one of the things I found in my research is they have a tendency to take people that are very submissive and don't question things. Right. 
I've I, uh, I've I've studied that people who are very strong minded, they have a difficulty planting those screened memories. Right. People who are strong minded and not easily manipulated. Um, I think they leave alone. It's the ones that they can easily manipulate are the ones that they have a tendency to abduct. Absolutely. I, I think that it's their technologies and, and how they implant and mind wipe are so far in advance to us. It's like we're like chickens and cows yeah. to them. Uh, they're looking for other oh. fault, uh, characteristics and qualities. And it's often a certain blood right. or a lineage. Um, so um, George Casabillas was saying that they have taken every human being alive on this planet that's ever lived and they um, they, they uh, periodically take them up until they're like in their late teens or something and then they, they select the ones for their program that are going to work out the best and then um, they continue to contact them sometimes their entire lives sometimes in previous lives so they got the, the, the certain type of soul um relationship that goes beyond the current incarnation so that's what my research is saying is showing sash you have anything to add to that uh, no no <laughs> okay i have a question though who who is who is they and what is their program do you want to answer that first sash? Uh, the, the anunnaki go ahead Go ready? ahead, Jan. You want me to go? Okay. Well, the, no, it, it appears to be a number of species is the program. Uh, the grays are part of it. There's tall whites. There's uh, uh, the um, mantis. There's a mantis mix. There's the Anunnaki. We're not sure what the, the program is fully, but it seems that they are uh, trying to up-level up the vehicles in which we can have incarnations. So this has been going on for a long time. Uh, some of us have uh, been, uh, you know, cross-pollinated and bred. We have uh, avian DNA. So they use the best, uh, or what they're, what they're trying to create something from uh, all these different species. And our soul origins are, are often from different planets, not just uh, human Earth origin souls and um, human Earth bodies. But the end result, they, they created this um, metagene, which is the ability to communicate all the way to source while you're in a, a form, in an avatar. Uh, and it's like a high-level ability that it took generations and generations to finally create. And now that they, it was so long ago, I, get, I don't know, there's something about the story that I don't remember how they... They created it, or they created it by accident. So they're testing for this metagene, which uh, these are highly advanced souls and beings. Um, so that's part of what they're doing. They're searching for the metagene and how to reproduce that. Is that what you recall from, I forget which person was explaining that to us. Do you remember, Tosh, where we got that from? Oh, uh, uh, I'm trying to find the, uh, Penny. Uh, Penny Bradley was telling us about it. Penny uh, right. has a lot of information on the metagene. But long ago, when uh, Enki uh, uh, decided to breed a special uh, line of slaves, he uh, he started always educating the smartest of the kids that he begat with the uh, slave race. That's us in what was called the Snake Society. And basically, he was saying, when the time is right and the environmental press is is correct, then genes will be activated in you that have been latent until the right time. And now is the right time um, for this uh, the, the time for the, uh, the, the, uh, the time for the new yuga. The Kali yuga is over. The, the age of the Satya yuga, the age of uh, Aquarius or Enki, Lucifer is, is here. And we're just going through the perturbations as the Kali Yuga, uh, the the dinosaur thrashes its last. Great. So, you were 
trying something in today on a Nazi more. What did you want to, what information did you want to present to us today, Sash? Oh, I, I was just, uh, what I was just going to uh, talk about is, is how it came about that, uh, that we, we came about. And uh, it, it, there was actually a lot of different things were conflated in the, in the Bible and its various uh, permutations. But basically, there was, there was two really big creations, two Adams and two Eves. The uh, Anunnaki were, are these great big people from the planet Nibiru. Uh, which comes through the inner solar system here every uh, 3,600 years. It did in those days anyway. And 450,000 years ago, they came and they were looking for gold. Uh, they found it in Southeast Africa and they were shipped it up to the, the uh, Persian Gulf and flew it to a uh, base on Mars, transshipped it to their planet where it was, um, it was transformed into white powder of more, more atomic gold and filled up the, the a hole in their ionosphere that they had created by thermonuclear war. And so these, uh, so they, they had miners, people from their planet thought they were going to save their planet and they volunteered and they came to Earth and they were under, under the ground for a long, long time. No, no, no sex, no, not enough beer and so forth. They were on the verge of uh, mutiny and the head scientists who'd been experimenting with Homo erectus, which was a, uh, an intelligent uh, hominoid who was already on the planet. Uh, from the seeding that had happened as a result of the Council of Hetona on Andromeda many uh, hundreds of thousands of years before that. But in any case, uh, Homo erectus was in Africa, and uh, the, the scientist, uh, Lucifer, was just utterly fascinated by Homo erectus because Homo erectus was telepathic, could seem to phase in and phase out even to, uh, sometimes, but was letting all the other animals out of his traps. and. He, he looked at this and said, this is an amazing uh, being. This is a, it's, it's a human of some kind and it's telepathic and it's compassionate. The Anunnaki, my people, are just war mongers. They're dominator consciousness. They, they, they have no compassion they have, and, and they, they've got to talk all the time. And so, I'm, you, know, I, I, you know what, I, I bet you I could use our genome with their genome and make a new uh, species here. I, I'll foment the miners to revolt, and um, then they'll, and then I'll come up with my solution. I've got a slave species I can make, and um, so that's exactly what happened. And when he made the slave species, the boss came down and, and said, "What is this? Your, your experiment you're doing? Uh, I want you to uh, get, you know, keep these guys working, and if they don't work, uh, the volunteers just execute them." And you hey, know, we ain't got to do that, bro. All we got to do is, is just uh, uh, we'll make obedient slaves. Uh, and, and so they had a big fight about it and a compromise. Well, OK, you can make slaves, but they got to be clones. I don't want breedable. OK, deal, deal, deal. However, they made them breedable. And that was the, the first. Uh, and uh, the, the boss wanted to see him. So he came up out from Africa up to their place in uh, at Basra in the Persian Gulf. And the boss, that's Yahweh, and Leo, who was next door, came by to see these uh, uh, creatures that were just supposed to be. There was a, they made a female clone, too, and um, so they could amuse each other with sex. But they, but they weren't breedable, as far as the boss was concerned. And he sees this little girl. She's obviously pregnant. She's not a little girl. She's like, you know, 15 or 16. And she comes right up here all chatting. Look at, look, look at the clothes I made and, and see this table. I'm making a, a – and she was you know, just talking like a chatty little girl. And, and the boss, Yahweh, was immensely enraged. He said, you were just supposed to make clones, he says to Lucifer. Uh, get, get these things out of here. Go have them breed in, in Africa. So anyways, that was 300,000 years ago. The first, uh, and these, these were children they made from zygotes with the Homo erectus plus their genes, plus they put the uh, fertilized zygotes in Anunnaki women. And so they're two different Anunnaki women, and so you get two different babies. And the first girl that they, the first boy that they made that way was a brown boy. His skin was red brown, like this clay of Africa, uh, and he had dark, pinky hair, and he was just like. Nibirian boys, except he had a foreskin, which they lack. And that came out of Nimma or Lilith. The other, the first girl came out of a blonde mother, Domkina, uh, uh, the chief, Lucifer, Lucifer, Lucifer's wife. And she was a sandy blonde with blue eyes. So, 
from the get-go. Tiamat was a girl, you know, Adamu was a boy, Adamu was brown, uh, Tiamat was white. That's our, that's our heritage. We are all like this from the get-go. And uh, so that's, uh, that's something to, to know. And uh, 200,000 years ago, when uh, these original um, slaves, uh, it was hard times, they finally said, we've had, you know, times are tough. We're not going to, what's with this yellow stuff that we keep digging out of the earth? Let's go off in the African bush and have our own lives and this sort of mutiny and living their own lives and creating their own cultures. And so the boss, Yahweh, says to Lucifer, you, you know, you better make me some better slaves. And by better, he meant that they obey him. And so Lucifer said, oh, I, I know how to do that. So he went and found two of the prettiest, and he had uh, kids with them. And then it, it goes on and on. That's the second one. That's when you get the Cain Abel story that you, that you all know. There's been lots and lots of incursions, including when the uh, astronaut corps uh, revolted and uh, ran off with the uh, the prettiest of this latest batch of slaves and started living in Canaan. These are all the, the giants of old. But anyway, that's a little bit of our story. But the point is that we have been uh, black and white, brown and white from the very get-go. And there were already other people here from the days of Atlantis and other people in the Chinese area. Um, just that the stories we get from Sumer or from Iraq and Turkey are from Iraq and Turkey, where, where these Anunnaki were. But there's other uh, extraterrestrials all over the planet from all different uh, time frames and, and so forth. That's a little bit of what um, you might want to kick around. So we're looking at the history of slavery. So from the very get-go, we were created as slaves to mine the gold. And so there's a long history of slavery. My, uh, Sasha has this incredible library of books, a lot of historical books. And all throughout time, you see one uh, powerful group of people come in and conquer and enslave another group of people. And sometimes they're the same color skin, sometimes they're different color skin, uh, they, you know, are different tribes, uh, some come from another part of the world and they, you know, come by boat or, or march and somehow penetrate their uh, defenses and then next thing you know they're um, killing most of the men, grabbing the women, making babies with them and, and you know, it's basically they're slaves. Can you tell us a little bit more of the connection between the first original slaves, and I, you're the historian, honey. What's the next generation? Who was the next that you recall? Uh, that the, 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 the very theater? what happened? Okay, yes, yes, certainly. What happened is as soon as any of these people uh, get free, the first thing they do is enslave their neighbors, and uh, as they uh, recover after uh, Noah's flood, and uh, uh, the Anunnaki spared Noah and his. Uh, his sons were supposed to rule for them. And the first thing all of these different people with different kingdoms wind up doing is uh, getting the people from the hills to build their cities, getting uh, conquering the people in the next door neighborhood and using using them. So the, that's the very next thing. All the Anunnaki start uh, 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 slaving on their own and stealing each other's slaves. And the worst form of slavery that we've always had is uh, is military corvée. Hey, kid. To take this weapon, go kill people you don't even know, and cut off heads and do all these things, and they'll kill you too, Groovy. You know, well, that's what that's 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 part of dominator consciousness, which has been ours from the get-go by these Anunnaki. But you know what? They've evolved too. They really have. Uh, you know, and so there's been some really big events. And part of when you see people with a metagene, people like uh, uh, like the Buddha, like Jesus. Uh, we, you get uh, like Leonardo. Uh, you, you see, there are there is something very, very uh, special of people that can break the dominator consciousness. And the person that did it, first of all, in a big way, was Lilith or Nimma. And basically, in her domains, which were Turkey and, uh, and areas like that, especially after Yahweh nuked uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Canaan. Uh, but but in Lilith's area, the great goddess area, there was partnership. No one had to be 
dominant. There wasn't a hierarchy. There isn't a religion with people telling you what to do. There was trade. There wasn't walled cities. There was uh, no slavery. The women had high positions. Uh, it was really different. And then when, when Satan, that's uh, Lucifer's son, Marduk, winds up as Zeus, uh, uh, conquering um, the rest of, of the um, Minoan uh, Empire, the area that Lilith had her uh, partnership society going in. Then after that, when it's the Greeks and the Romans, you've got that. That's basically Satan Marduk uh, versus uh, the people down in uh, in the Canaan area, and that's uh, Yahweh. And uh, these two royal um, lineages are fighting it out and then intermarrying and, and, and dominating the world. But there's lots of other high civilizations that were happening all over the planet. Uh, and uh, it's it's way more complex th than that. But the history that we have from Sumer, from Iraq, is the stuff that the, the winners wrote. But then people who uh, started writing what they wrote had to keep modifying it to justify uh, their political position of domination over other people. And you, if you study the Bible, you can see exactly uh, where... First of all, they're trying to get what, whatever the, the, the uh, Anunnaki taught them. And then an, another group comes in and they're reinterpreting and trying to make women to blame for everything bad that ever happened. It goes on and on. You can just see who, then the crazy Jamie gets to be, uh, uh, be king of England and he's all after witches. I mean, wow. It's so obvious that uh, the people are just talking about abductions and, and things like that in the terms that they and the symbols that they had. Uh, just like we do in terms of the symbols that we have, but it's the same phenomena. I pass. Okay. Sasha, can I can I ask a question? How many different seeding events do you think have taken place on our planet, if you had to estimate? How many different what kind of events? Seeding events. Like you, I asked you this question a few months ago, and I said there was multiple seeding events. The Anunnaki weren't the only ones, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. How, I, it's very difficult to say how many, but I can tell you about the, the story that we get from a whole bunch of different records. Is okay. that uh, as people, as as uh, humanoid people, uh, Lyrans, we're all uh, descended from the Lyrans who were attacked by the Dracos. As 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 they uh, uh, they, they they came here, they fought wars with the Dracos and so forth, and finally. Uh, People in the galaxy were getting really upset, and they called a, a peace treaty at the a planet called Hatona in the Andromeda group. And they decided that they would make proto-beings in, in, the, in the terraforming, because the, a lot of uh, different people were in, uh, species were interested in terraforming and uh, settling the Earth. And the Dracos had been here a million years before the humanoids, because they had... Um, put the moon in place and settled on Lemuria and their dinosaurs, which was their beef, were all over and so forth. That was way before the Atlant the Atlans came to Atlantis or the uh, Maldecans came to the Gobi Desert. And so, but in any case, they, every species that uh, had, every ET species that had something going on Earth could put into this proto-human. And so the one reptilian species and 12 humanoid species contributed genes that the, the uh, Reptilian species uh, gave us our brain stems, fight or flight, automatic regulation, all, all that thinking. And each part, each group thought this this part's going to be dominant, and, um, and and so forth. And so we have different contributions. And Homo erectus was was the being that then evolved from the proto being in the African area. Okay. We know that the, okay. we know that the that the that they. Small people, uh, uh, probably the greys uh, of some kind, um, have, have rescued and taken care of uh, the Zuni and the Hopi and the, and the people of North America. We know that the Chinese, uh, there, were, there were people uh, that crashed in China. Uh, we know there was a major, major uh, Stargate uh, ways of getting really easily from um, Venus to Earth. As uh, a matter of fact, the city that just burned down in uh, Earth was the, where the Venusians regularly uh, come here. Uh, 
countless individuals and uh, small groups of, of ETs, as well as organized larger groups, have interacted with Earth and made babies with us and taken us aboard and used our genetics. Lots and lots. Some have been invasions. Some have been uh, like the people from Serpa who came. Um, and they did an exchange. Twelve Americans went to Serpa in the Zeta Reticula group. And they sent uh, an ambassador and a technician to help us uh, um, make our anti-grav uh, craft so we could stand off the Nazis. But the Nazis won anyway because of uh, um, Project uh, Paperclip, where they brought the Nazis over to take over the uh, military industrial uh, complex. Well, the Anunnaki have seen all, all these things going on, especially since Marduk got uh, control of the Earth and started pitting everybody against everybody else. And uh, Nayanar came back as Allah and his agents started fighting um, Marduk, Satan's agents. But ultimately, Satan was in charge, and he started pitting all these different centers of power against each other so that none of them really realize that he's on top. So you have the intelligence services, the oil industry, you have the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Western Alliance, you have the Chinese, and all these different, and there's the monetary things, there's the different churches, and all of these things had uh, the hidden hand with Satan, and uh, he, he has um, you know, uh, 300, 200, 300 of his Anunnaki followers, and then lots and lots of hybrid in between people like Kissinger that run that run things like that. No, it's never stopped. ETs have continuously been in touch with Earth, and they're in touch with it right now. Okay, so now in Tiwanaku in Lake Titicaca, there is a megalithic site there that's very ancient, and there's yeah. a wall there that has the heads of different beings, some from this planet, some not. Was that like a place where they met or a yes. meeting place? It was, a, it was a place where people could take off when the Anunnaki uh, knew they were going to have to leave because Marduk was going to take the uh, uh, their um, space station in the, in the Sinai. They built the second spaceport at Tiwanaku, right. and the gate to Tiwanaku was called Pumapuka. And they right. put these heads there. It became a place, uh, first of all, that people would, later on would, would come to as a sacred place. But it was basically where uh, people could come in and out. There was an underwater base underneath uh, uh, Lake Kitikaka. And uh, also the Indians there, which are really from, from uh, Southeast Asia, from, from um, the Indian uh, area. Um, the the uh, South American Indians sheltered through, this, through the great... Uh, through Noah's flood on the islands in the middle of uh, Lake Titicaca. And so that that's one of the uh, several places where uh, it's a portal. And people keep to this day keep coming and going. We have skulls with the elongated uh, heads there. Yeah. We have bulls in the, in, a, in the museum in Bolivia. There's a bull with, with, with uh, written in Akkadian, a Sumerian language, with, with the symbol of Nima all over it. There's pictures of Adad, or Viracocha, as he's known there. He landed at Paracas Bay, and, and, and at the end of uh, Paracas Bay is a great big symbol of, uh, of Adad, or um, Ish, Ishtar, as he's known in the east, but he's Viracocha. Uh, he was the one that brought the Incas there much, much, much later, after... Uh, but most of the Anunnaki left, except and they left Earth mainly to Marduk, Satan. And they they left in 311 BC, right? Yeah, 311 BC, particularly the Maya. Uh, uh, the Maya were spacefaring, and so there, there's millions of people. And uh, uh, Thoth, or uh, he's known as Kuku Clan uh, by the Maya, uh, uh, taught them and. Uh, to be spacefaring, and on the uh, sarcophagus of Lord Pakal, uh, you, there's actually shows him inside of his uh, his capsule. And other informants have told us basically that the Maya uh, are spacefaring. They're rescuing people from the from the uh, uh, dark fleet bases wherever they can. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, colony of them uh, with Yahweh nowadays, and Yahweh has, has mellowed out in his. Uh, now he's in a Kepler 69C, we're told, with uh, which is peopled by Mayans and, and his, his staff. Now, when you tell this story, you know, it challenges people's beliefs and it can be very scary for people. But you always say at the end, this is going to be great not to worry. Why do you say that? 
because it already is great, but most of most people are too locked into uh, uh, whatever they're locked into to 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 realize to not realize it. But from my perspective, everything is absolutely perfect the way it's supposed to be. It couldn't be any better. The challenges that we feel, the suffering that we feel, the pain that we hear are the challenges that we need to. Uh, it's the perturbation that we need to bring in this new age and something beautiful is happening. Can't you feel it? I can, anyhow. Maybe that's <laughs> only me. I'm, yeah, I'm glad. And I, every day I'm thankful that I for this life and this experience, and I, I, I'm happy. <laughs> and the only thing that stopped me from being happy before was the imagined future and the dead past. So... The imagined future and the dead past kept you from being happy. So I'm assuming that means you live in the moment. Yes? Yes. And you've yes. shaken the God spell, right? That's right. And that is probably the two things that have been key to you finding the happy place, correct? Uh- yeah, and there's some there's some dynamics of it that everything that you think ain't you, especially things that bug you or that you overly admire, are resonating parts of you that are just aching to be developed and recognized and to see how they contributed to protecting your vulnerability and how uh, if you're aware of them, you won't react to other people and you can be compassionate and uh, uh, reach for their vulnerability and uh, address yourself to that rather than their defenses. Right. Okay. So if you were to give people three pieces of advice on how to achieve the same happiness you found and how to get past all this chaos and this anxiety and stress that society is creating, what would that be? Do what you've got, don't sweat what you've not. That's what the Buddha said. Let go, let, let go of all suffering. What causes suffering is when you want what you ain't got or when you don't want what you do got. And all you got to do is appreciate what you have. And then it's cornucopia because you've got what you've got, so you're already okay. And then if you don't get the desire, something you, you desire, uh, you want, uh, you're still okay. And if you do get it, you're double okay. And it's cornucopia, so you can't lose. All you got to do is... Um, is appreciate the things there are to appreciate in every moment as much as you possibly can. Janet, do you agree? Well, my perspective, and I agree with Sasha, he's been one of my primary teachers, but part of what I learned is through, you know, do my own family of origin and cultural conditioning and religious programming. There's a point you get to when you're doing your own work and going inside and becoming introspective and reflective is that you realize that we made this all up. That at the highest level we are God, source, universal consciousness, that we have subparts into our subpersonalities, our different avatars, our different lifetimes. Um, This this one uh, thing I have there, Elder Grace said there's only one lifetime if you think of it that way there's one life and it's been sectioned into all these lives and then we think that we're separate and we think we're sasha and we're deborah and we're janet but there's only one life so as this one universal consciousness we decided to make a game it's just like a computer programmer we're going to make a game and we're all going to come down into these avatars and in one lifetime you're going to play the villain, and in the other lifetime, you're going to play the hero. And in between, you're all the different, uh, the, the Klein, and you're light and dark, good and bad. But if you watch a play, and there's a villain in it, at the end, when they're doing the curtain call, the one that gets the biggest applause are the villains, because the villains are the catalysts, and, the, you know, they make things so extreme that you have to, you have to um, make a decision. You can't sit on the fence. You can't be a little bit pregnant. You have to commit yourself to somewhere, and eventually that will come. You have to commit yourself. You can't just be neutral, neutral. And so that is what accelerates your growth through these things that we're calling lifetimes. So I've come to that awareness, but, you know, when you come to that awareness, it doesn't stick. And 
Um, so you come back into this other awareness and you're having re reactions to your own stuff and um, you, you think you've arrived, you think that you're, you're finally got over everything and then something bigger comes and, and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm in the game, I'm in the matrix, um, you know, I'm still participating in the game. So that's kind of an overview. Back to you. So is there a way for us to leave the Matrix and not participate in this game? What do you think, Sasha? You want to answer that? Without dying. Sasha? Well, uh, the first thing, well, yes, can you hear me? One of the, in, one of the insights of, 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 of existential therapy is that when a person asks a question, there's several things behind it. One is they have a hypothesis, a guess about how the other person's going to answer. That's very interesting. But the most interesting one of all is what does it mean to that uh, person uh, who asked the, uh, the question? Okay, so if you, if you would repeat your question and then say what answer you think we're, we'd give and then say what your answer to it and then I'll answer. <laughs> and, and the strategy in life is to say, well, before I answer your question, I'd like to know uh, what's your interest in asking that question? Where are you coming from personally? Me? Why I'm asking that? Yeah. Because I have found myself leaving the game, not participating in any of this. Like... I've stepped away. I, I've i lost all my fear. I've had so many bad things happen to me that I've overcome that I'm not afraid of anything anymore. And I just realized that probably about two years ago. It, nothing scares me. The worst that could happen has happened, and I'm still standing, right? And I'm okay. So the fear is gone. I'm not afraid to take chances or risks. At my age, a lot of people are afraid to take risks or gambles, and I'm not. I'm not afraid. I've done it so many times, it doesn't scare me. If I were to lose everything today and start over tomorrow, I would be fine. And I've lost all sense of materialism. Like, I'm trying to get rid of everything I own. I just don't want stuff. I find it a burden. I find it like it's baggage. Um, Money, I could care less about it. I I need it in this world, in this matrix to survive, right? But I'm trying to find a way to change that dynamic. You know, how can I become self-sufficient the way the natives were and not need any of this infrastructure or any of this matrix that's been created for us to depend on? I'm trying to teach my children how to leave this matrix. I, I foresee a different life for us. I believe the Native Americans were the closest way to the way we should have been living. I believe we could take lessons from the Six Nations, Six Nations on how they were warring and came together and lived as a peaceful people. Um, I mean, the Founding Fathers didn't go to the Tuscarora for advice for no reason at all. So there's something more we should be looking for, and it's not the stuff in the Matrix. I'm passing the baton off. Okay. So uh, I love what you're saying about uh, listening to the native people. Uh, I, I really uh, feel for that. As an anthropologist, uh, you know, I and my colleagues have gone to all over the world and uh, lived with people uh, from every persuasion. We find that people, whatever their cultural symbols are, are always able to uh, reach the point that, that, that the three of us have, no matter how they symbol it. And so it, th that's it. And, uh, uh, you know, we can uh, feel much more connected with Earth if we follow the way of uh, the Native people. It's really stupid to say you can't learn from other people. <laughs> we have this font of wisdom of these people that somehow survived and kept their wisdom uh, together uh, despite our, uh, our, our love of gadgets. And uh, it's time to, to, to listen up. And I think it's time to really look at intelligent reparations uh, for people uh, so that they have decent health education uh, uh, and life opportunities. Uh, it's like terrible the way we have uh, treated everyone that isn't a white, an old white man from the South. And basically, this is, this is a, we've got to stop. It's stupid. It's stupidity. We've got to love 
one another and learn from each other. Well, that goes back. I agree. That goes back. Sorry, to sorry, Jana, go ahead. Okay, let me say a couple things. That goes back to the Anunnaki. The original racism came from the Anunnaki, who were predominantly, you know, tall white people with uh, blonde or light brown and blue or green, very light eyes. And then the people they were, when they were hybridizing with human beings, for the most part, they were brown or black or red. So that was the original polarity, that was the original racism. Um, they thought they were superior, they weren't even human, they were extraterrestrial. And we still have this, these dynamics acting out to this day. And, um, you know, I challenge anybody to go back and listen to all the, the stories that are coming out about you know, the slavery, going back to Washington, holding his slaves and Jefferson, and I spend an evening watching those, and, and I just start, like, blowing up with tears and crying and, and saying, well, that was an atrocity, but it wasn't that long ago. My great-grandfather was fought in the Civil War. My, my mother's grandfather fought in the Civil War. So, you know, we're just talking um, hundreds and whatever it is years ago. So I'd like to look at that in the second hour because this is where it originated from. This dominator, we're an advanced species, <clears throat> we're from another planet. And there was a point where the Anunnaki had to go underground because the humans realized that they could harm or kill Anunnaki. Of course they have the ability to revive but they started making a barrier between themselves. They were very accessible at one point and they walked among us, but then they started to put on the mask like we see uh, with the folk and they built cigarettes and they had the priesthood and the kingships and they made a decision to withdraw from the earth, but some never left, but a, a large majority of it, them left. And after a long war which resulted in Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of uh, you know most of the humanity at this, at this time, they decided to leave the planet and leave it to Marduk to rule. So, um, and this all is, is tied into slavery throughout the ages, through the, you know, talking about the royals, why the royals are this bloodline, they're better than us, and all that stuff. So, uh, Sash, do you want to say anything, or Deborah? We have, I guess, two minutes before the break. Yeah, well, the one thing my entire childhood that I've never understood I never understood where the concepts of royalty and slavery came from because Homo erectus didn't deal in those concepts, right? So I've always wondered that. And since I've been a little girl, I've been obsessed with two things, slavery and Native Americans, only to find out when I got older where I lived and was born is Tuscarora Nation land and the last stop on the Underground Railroad. So, uh -oh. What did you want to say, Sash? We have like a, what, two minutes? Uh, uh, so, you know, if you look at the level of civilization uh, in the uh, eastern coast of North America at the time when uh, uh, the uh, English and French and Spanish were coming, you see that the Cherokee Nation was a, 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 a an agriculture nation. They had uh, they had translated the Bible into Cherokee. Uh, the uh, the League of the Iroquois, the Hosawani, uh, was a democracy. Uh, these are high civilizations working right where the colonists and and the people that came from Europe came with this writ, this law that. Uh, uh, they could kill the people and take the land and the resources of every place that didn't believe in the, in in, the, in their in their particular brands of Christianity. Uh, this is a license to murder people. This is uh, this is typical Anunnaki stuff. And they almost wiped themselves out. They had a north south war where they nuked each other. Uh, is we are doing the same stupid stuff they are. It's based on hierarchy, domination, who's on top. These are people who will kill to be the one on top, and, and they boss everyone underneath them. Uh, and women have no rights, and kids have even less. 
and their cruelty to animals and cruelty to the environment. And it's, it's, it's such an obvious stupidity that people are getting it now, uh, thanks to a little uh, Norwegian girl uh, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> a murdering policeman. And, and it brought all this to a head now. a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You opposed to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. This is the people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop us. They're gonna kill us all. See how the trouble you've had it? Be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. When the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart. Revolution Radio at FreedomSlips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You call down the thunder, well now you Thanks for listening while we take that short break here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. And now we're going to get back to your host. Aloha and we're back. Welcome back to the Sacred Matrix. Uh, once again, I'm Janet Kerr Lesson with Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson and Deborah DeFranco. And we're just talking about all kinds of things that are relevant and interesting. Uh, before we get back to our show, I'd like to remind everybody to please go over to the donation button on revolution.radio, and you can make a one-time donation button at the top left link, and then in the middle, uh, there's the Patreon donation button, which is recurring. 
We do thank you very much for your donation. Okay, so um, we have another hour to go. Uh, what I'd like to do is tie in the ancients to the modern. We have these current issues. The, the Anunnaki in, introduced plagues into our system. The Anunnaki introduced slavery into our system. The Anunnaki introduced religion, and they introduced politics. They introduced kings and queens and monarchies and hierarchy. So we're in this Anunnaki reality. We're acting it out. We're still doing the same things that we did before. And Sasha, you, there was a problem. I don't know if you found it. The past, the future self. Wait a minute. Just, just keep talking for a few minutes. I'll, I'm, still, I'm still trying to get it up. It's, you know, my machine is acting up. Just you keep talking. I'll get it in a minute. Okay, Deborah, what would you like to say? Sasha's finding this poem which is beautiful about the past. <laughs> So in tying in the past to the present, you know, I have this one question. You know how they define insanity, right? You keep repeating the same behaviors, expecting different results. We as humans keep repeating the same behaviors, expecting different results. Why are we not learning our lessons? Because we don't have the full history. We have this history that's been warped, manipulated, changed. It's very Orwellian. Whoever are the victors of the war write the history from their perspective and skew things and over and over, and we find ourselves doing the same things. And if we had the truth yeah. of the history, we would be uh, coming to different conclusions, and we could create that utopian society. You know, it's not going to be perfect because then we'll be dead, but it's going to have interesting things to do, but we don't have to be killing each other. And so that's... So do you... Do you think we'll naturally evolve to that point? You know, it's a crapshoot right now. Um, we're doing what we can to get the truth out, but what we find is once somebody who's the researcher and the author and gets the truth out and then they die, somebody comes in and takes over the information and warps it and twists it. And it's just everything gets warped over time. I'm not sure why that happens or what's what's the grand design purpose for that, but um, I've seen it over and over, you know, research comes die, somebody comes in and uh, builds upon their research, but they always twist it. Every time the observer uh, interprets information, there's always a twist from the observer, the one that's doing the observing. So we could only, we, we watched a, um, a Beatles thing. So we were the generation that grew up with the Beatles, and then we saw this uh, across the divide, across the universe or something, and it was such a distortion of what we grew up with. <laughs> we were in this movie theater just cringing, and it was like, oh, they've already just screwed that up, and, you know, it's just been whatever it was at the time, 30 years. or So imagine 100 years from now. Uh, if you survive enough to be remembered, you know, there's, there's certain people that are remembered like Marilyn Monroe, but will Marilyn Monroe be remembered, you know, 500 years from now or 1,000 years? So we're just a, a, a blip in time, and we've got to do as much as we can because we – and that's why the, the Anunnaki always succeed because they don't have these gaps in their history. In fact, they're, they're still here. They didn't die and come back and forth in and out of the cycle of birth, death, re rebirth, reincarnation. And so, anyway, that's what we're up against. So, Sasha, did you find what you were looking for? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, indeed, I, I did. Um, and I, I'll read it. Uh, this is, uh, what happened is... Uh, Wait a minute, something's coming up. Do, 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 do I want to delete this file? No. Oh, I don't want to delete this file. Why do you do that? In any case, uh, the, uh, after uh, Yahweh had ordered the, uh, the Sodom uh, and, and Gomorrah uh, bomb because they had gone over to Satan, to Marduk, and uh, he was, and Marduk was bringing his soldiers up uh, from Egypt too. So they were doing a, a pincer from two different directions on the uh, Sinai spaceport, and so uh, Yahweh ordered the uh, uh, the end of the uh, Salt Sea nuked, 
and it became the Dead Sea and it wiped out Zoar and Sodom and Gomorrah. And they also bombed the spaceport in the Sinai. And so most of the Anunnaki uh, left and uh, but they left us with their legacy and they said they'd be back. And so this and so uh, uh, in retrospect, uh, Enki, the chief scientist, Lucifer, dictated this uh, this tome to his scribe who was named Endubskar. And Endubskar wrote down uh, all of this stuff. And it was started with this uh, uh, statement by Enki. And I'm going to read it. Uh, and Sitchin, got, of course, got, got uh, this collection of uh, inscriptions and put it all together because the end of each inscription was the first line and the next one. So he was able to put these tablets together. And this is, it was all set off by this one right here. At the end of days, the day of judgment there shall be. The earth shall quake and the rivers change course. Then there shall be a darkness at noon and a fire in the heavens at night. The day of the returning celestial god, Nibiru, the far orbiting 10th planet of our solar system, will it be? And who shall survive and who shall perish? Who shall be rewarded and who shall be punished? Gods, the astronauts from Nibiru, and men alike. On that day it shall be discovered, for what shall come to pass by what had passed shall be determined. And what was destined shall in a cycle be repeated. And what was fated, and only by the heart's will occurring for good or ill, shall for judgment come. The record could read, the past remembered, the future on prophecy understand. Let the future of the past the judgment be. These are the words of Enki, firstborn of King Anu of Nibiru. And that's, that's a quote from uh, the last book of Enki, The Prophets of an Extraterrestrial God by Zechariah Sitchin. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. Some of the people we interview say that, that we've all had thousands and thousands of lives. And in a sense, no matter how you look at it, if you, you, the wisdom of all humanity has filtered down to us. It's in our, our Akashic records, in the singularity within where our singularity meets the experience of the singularity of every thing and every molecule in the universe. So it's, it's all there, and it's a good show. I'll turn it over to you, ladies. I like that. Thank you. It's been a long time since I've heard that. So basically, um, the two brothers, Ed and Enlil, uh, had a long history, and, and their clans, they, they went into tribalism, they had their clans, and by the time they uh, came to the earth and they, they um, had children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and so on and so forth, they had divided the earth into two clans, into two tribes. And just like the Native Americans that, um, that we talk about frequently here, even they were tribal, they were into tribalism, and for some reason, their tribes, and they were all, you know, originally the same tribe probably, were fighting brother against brother, father against child. So what is going on here that we, humanity, keeps dividing and, and separating? So part of it is our nature, and they have been uh, the powers of be or the Anunnaki. They would, at one point, there were too many earthlings and not enough Anunnaki. And they were in danger of being eradicated. There were something like a thousand Anunnaki and uh, probably millions of humans. So they started these systems of divide and conquer, and, and they kept us so distracted. They shortened our lifetime, our life expectancy, and we're so distracted in these sub-characteristics. And every, every once in a while, they introduce another religion. Like in the 1800s, they introduced... Uh, Mormonism, and so that's another division of uh, policies and, and ideas and concepts, and uh, that's another place where people war with each other, and they kill each other, and then in the modern age, they introduce, you know, the New Age religion, so one of their divide and conquer techniques is religion. Uh, okay, so I'm going to pass the talking stick to Deborah. What would you like to say? 
Well, I don't believe in organized religion at any level. I, you know, I'm spiritual, but I realized that most of organized religion is filled with just horrible dogma that just makes you judge and hate people. And I realized that when I was a little girl, like I had questions. My mom used to teach Sunday school and I used to go with her and I had all these questions for the elders in the church and not once were they ever answered ever with an answer that made any sense. And I hate when you talk to religious people and their, their, their go-to answer is, well, you just have to have faith, right? Faith in what? Because I think when you strip away all the dog, dogma from a religion, the basic tenets are the same of each of them. So that's why I don't understand. I mean, there's been more people killed in the name of God than there has been in wars. So it just... I, I I am floored even today with what's going on in this country, the religious right. Um, I stay out of churches, and you know why? Because I find most of the people that I do not like in society go to church. I find them to be very judgmental, to be very petty. Um, I don't think they're welcoming to people that aren't like them. And I find it very disturbing. I shed religion probably when I was 10 years old. I don't go to church. I won't go to a church. And I am very disturbed when you walk into a church that within the first hour, you're probably asked anywhere from four to eight times for money. All they do is ask for money the whole time you're there. That is so disturbing to me. Well, this I'm passing the baton. This kind of ties into what you're saying. Now, I, found, I don't have enough here. Um, there's a couple articles on AquarianRadio.com. Lower cognitive ability linked to noncompliance with social distancing guidelines during the coronavirus outbreak. So there's an article on that. Another one I'm going to go into a little bit more. Conspiracy mentality linked to noncompliance with an official, but not unofficial, court coronavirus prevention measure. So what they found is that um, people with heightened conspiracy mentality, uh, at first they adopt behaviors to prevent the spread of COVID-19, I mean COVID-19, until they, uh, those behaviors are endorsed by the government. <laughs> and it, it seems that um, we can see that many people are reluctant to follow preventive behaviors precisely because it's being seen as serving the interests of certain industrial or political groups. Uh, so this is a, a divide and conquer. So we come, so we've been polarized to the mask wearers and the non-mask non wearers. <laughs> and but you know, people are saying this is my right, this is my right, but. One person's rights and where another person's begin. So we do have rules and regulations to, you know, help people um, survive and um, be kind to each other. So you're supposed to wear a seatbelt. You need a license to drive. You know, those types of you don't smoke in um, restaurants anymore. You don't smoke in public. Uh, if you go outside or something. So there's lots of rules throughout time. But this has been so politicized because our president won't wear a mask and he's inspired the president of uh, Brazil and they've inspired, you know, Boris Johnson in the UK and so on and so forth. So the whole po planet's been polarized, you know, mask and no mask as a political strategy. And we, we could have knocked this out, you know, six months ago had we acted like uh, um, New Zealand and other countries, I, there was an article on that, where some of these countries had less than 100 deaths. They, they got on top of it and they knocked it out. But because the mask got politicized, we're going to have millions of people dead before the end of this uh, virus because the, the last one, which had about a third of the population, took a, a run around the planet for about three to four years. So this is not going to end anytime soon unless we really start adapting some behaviors and stop politicizing, you know, masks. I mean, that's absolutely absurd. 
But if you think of it in terms of the Anunnaki or who are the other species, perhaps this is an intentional culling of the planet. Maybe it's by the Anunnaki. Maybe it's by other species because we have stories now of, you know, the reptoids, reptilians or uh, dracos. They were here before the Anunnaki. They went underground due to uh, Nibiru coming through and the devastation that happens with the earth changes. But apparently they're awakened and conscious and they're coming up. And that's one of the hypotheses is that they want to call the earth's population of all these human beings that have taken over the planet like a bunch of rats. <laughs> um, so that might be behind the, the agenda. But it's not just a speculation. Both the Anunnaki, the... Um, one of the sons of Enki, known as Nigashita, wrote a book called The Emerald Tablets. And in that, he warns of the uh, interdimensional beings that come in and they shapeshift and they take over the council members. And you think you're talking to, you know, your president, but the president's been taken over by an interdimensional shapeshifting <laughs> reptilian. And... You know, it, you wonder with these people that are extremely uh, psychopathic, and there's a difference between a sociopath and a psychopath. The psychopath is quite murderous. He, and, and, you know, his actions result in people dying. So we have a president wh whose actions, his intentions were made manifest by his results. And we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dead. And by the end of this year, you know, it's going to be hundreds of thousands more. So, I'm going to pass the talking stick. Uh, Sash, you take it, but both are welcome to make comments on what I just said. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yes, I, well, you know, as I say, uh, that this is the perturbation or disturbance that is, uh, uh, and some of the good things that come out of that is, is the realization of our unity as a humanity. Uh, how we all facing the same crises of climate, which is exacerbated uh, by the racism that we have. And, and ultimately, there is another good thing which is coming out of all of this and coming out of something which was a fringe at first, but it really makes a lot of sense. And it's a, a prepper movement, which is like getting back to what our uh, Native Americans know anyway. It's like uh, one of the abductions that, that fascinates me. It's a, 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 a apocryphal. Uh, story is about uh, these two, the Grace uh, abducted these uh, two uh, uh, young boys, 12-year-old boys, and they gave them each a, uh, a stable uh, just filled with horse manure and gave them each a shovel and said, you, uh, you know, clean up the stable. And one boy just didn't do anything. He just thought it was a stupid job. He didn't do the other guy, boy jumped in there and he was digging and shoveling and shoveling. And, and then they interviewed both these kids. And, they, and, and this one kid said, well, with all that, with all that uh, uh, horse manure in there, there must be a pony somewhere. And, and it's like that. The prepper movement is our pony. Let's ride it. <laughs> The prepper movement is our pony. Yeah, I'm a prepper. I'm teaching my children to be my grandchildren to be preppers. That's right. That's uh, what we all have to. What's that? What are you prepping for? Are Are you prepping for an apocalypse? And at what level would we? No. We what I'm What I'm What I'm prepping for is for the when the infrastructure is destabilized. Right. That's what I've always prepped for. And back in the 80s, what led me to this was I we got hit by a hurricane in Houston and it was one of the worst in history. And we were without infrastructure for three weeks. We had no electricity, no water, no gas, no nothing. And no one was prepared. No one. And the neighborhood that we lived in was the last to get our infrastructure back. And that woke me up and made me realize this could all go out one day, right? The electricity could go out one day. I suspect it's going to. Not a matter of if, just when, right? We've already got brownouts all over the world. We've already got electricity issues all over the world. I mean, it's it's funneled by fossil fuel, which is, you know, speeding up climate change. So, I started prepping then. At that point, every time Christmas came around, I asked for prepping supplies. My family thought I was nuts. 
<laughs> you know, but I, I'm built uh, uh, prepping supplies. Like I've lived out of my house for the last four months. I've probably gone to the grocery store maybe four times. And that's only to get fresh food because I didn't have it growing in the garden. Had it not been for that, I probably wouldn't have had to leave this house for months. So that's what I'm prepping for is to not be dependent on the infrastructure, right? If the worst happens, I'm okay. So, and that's what I'm trying to teach my children, you know, how do you thrive and survive without being dependent on a system? Okay. And so, and so I'm not prepping for the world to come to an end. I don't think the world's going to come to the end, come to an end. I don't think the worst is going to happen. Do I think it's going to, the dynamics of the earth, of the planet are going to shift dramatically? Absolutely. Honestly, my personal opinion, and I could be wrong about this, I believe the ET presence is going to make itself known sometime before the end of 2021. And I think it's going to challenge a lot of people's beliefs, right? Because you'll have to go, oh, this isn't what we thought, right? Life is something much different. What do we do? You're going to have two reactions, you're either going to get scared, try to kill yourself, do something because you don't want to face what the reality is, or you're going to embrace it. I hope to be one of those people that embraces it. And I'm not afraid of change. I don't like things being the same. I don't like a routine. You know, I like the new. I like delving into different. I love spending time with a culture that I've never experienced before. I love seeing different dynamics of people and different cultures. And I've moved between cultures. I've had to because of my job in the garment industry. You know, I've traveled all over the world and dealt with many, many different people. And I move between worlds very easily. But I notice when I do it that it's very disturbing to other people. I prefer people who are not like me over people who are like me. Passing the baton. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a, the same kind of that. I'm a professional anthropologist. And so uh, what we do uh, and when we're young <laughs> is we go and live with totally immerse ourselves in other cultures, eat what they eat, work like they work, uh, and, uh, live in their language instead of our own language because language structures your thoughts. And so uh, what we have found is that uh, in every tradition, no matter what the symbols people use, they all, and, that, and they can even do that if they're in organized churches, even in organized churches where most people are bound by dogma, there are reflective people who talk and, and who live love with each other and are the real thing. Yeah, uh, I was at UCLA. And uh, we were right across from Marymount College, and the nuns that came there and the priests that came over, they all wound up quitting or getting kicked out, of course. But they were, they were free thinkers, just like us, uh, as radicals at UCLA. And it's, that's it. Enlightenment uh, it always stays with you in psychology. We call it the aware ego or witness. Once you can witness yourself, you're no longer a victim of whatever subpersonality is being evoked at the moment, but you can see you have a reserve that you can step back and observe, observe things and get the bigger picture. And then you're free to choose in a way that you weren't. Uh, and so, and, and prepper, prepping is really important uh, when, you, especially out here in Maui, the river rises and you can't get across. The tree falls on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, t the line and you're not going to get electricity. If you don't cut the trees that are overhanging your house, they fall down and break your house. You you, you know, it's like uh, being a prepper. It doesn't just mean uh, it means being able to do a lot of things. Uh, that have to do with climate change and being able to adapt to the vagaries of changing uh, Earth uh, situations. Right. Next. Are you complete? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I would love it if we would have continued our growing food like we had envisioned when I first came here 20, 
going on 24 years ago. So we've always had the vision of having a conscious community that, uh, you know, kind of lives on and off the grid, but able to sustain ourselves by growing our own food. So that was a wonderful concept. As we got busier and older and wrapped up in technology and doing things like traveling and radio shows, and there was no one home to mind the farm, uh, you know, the crops weren't planted and harvested and, the, and the, a lot of the vegetation is huge now and things are overgrown. So, but I really, I hear what you're saying. The only thing that kind of uh, bothers me is that we're, on some level, we're preparing for this apocalypse. And I'd like to bring it from the positive rather than we got to be prepared just in case the world's going to end. And I found myself doing that all through my life. I'll end up buying 10 of something I really like. And I'm going, why am I stocking up like someday they're not going to be available in the store? It's always been in the background. And we've had that all along. We've had stories of the rapture. And, um, and I think that might be a primal... Oh, memory of the of the apocalypse with um, Sodom and Gomorrah. It might be in our DNA, and then we had it in, in this modern era with um, you know World War Two. So I'm just wondering how we can do this from a positive space. Uh, this is the the goal we're going to, which is growing more natural food. You know, um, getting our feet and fingers and hands back in the soil, slowing down our lives, and I think that this um, COVID, at first initially, it slowed us down. We were in our homes, we weren't going outside. Us, we everything, outside. everything we could do without. Right, and, uh, and now we see the um, COVID is interrupting our distribution, our production of food. So I think we're already in the, the need for the prepper in a few more weeks or months if we keep going this way and we do not uh, curtail this spread of COVID, we're going to see a lot more things become more scarce, including foods. So we, we're already uh, living in a, a, a rock in the middle of the ocean in Maui. We see shortages all the time. We have to wait for the barges to come in. But, um, you know, I had a, a hell of a time buying Windex the past two weeks. <laughs> it's like, so you never know. <laughs> it's like, you know, I looked on Amazon, it's like $22 for Windex. No, I'm not spending $22 for Windex. So um, there are certain things that if you go spend $2 on vinegar, it'll yeah. do the same thing. Well, I'm just using it as an example, right? It's like, oh, okay. Now there's a run on Windex, toilet paper and now Windex. So what next, right? And, and so um, right. I couldn't find my turkey bacon. Finally, it came back in. Anyway, there seems to be a run on Windex. <laughs> our distribution systems are being interrupted. Our food growth, production, harvesting, packaging, and, and uh, you know, getting it on the, the plane, train, boat, uh, truck, whatever. Um, so I think we're already there. And since nobody's doing anything, we, we don't have any kind of leadership from the top of saying we need to establish these protocols. You know, we're on a, a, we're on a train that's going down a mountain and the brakes aren't working. So I know. Huh? We really need to do something. I mean, don't just sit there. Do something. And not, not run around saying, don't wear a mask, don't wear a mask. It's my rage, my freedom to kill you. You know, you don't have the right to kill me. You don't have the right to kill anybody else. Put on a freaking mask. Wear a shield if you've got COVID or what, COPD, you can't. Yeah, you, know, you can wear a shield. You can wear a shield and a mask. You know, do something. But making that an argument. And some people are getting killed over it all. They're getting hurt and killed over it. Mask, not mask. This is an intentional, another, yet another Anunnaki. And by the way, I just want to say this one thing. If you're a billionaire or a, a millionaire over X, I'm not sure. Let's just say you have over 10 million. I'm just picking that out of the air. But, you know, to get into that club where you're a millionaire, you have to sell your soul to the devil, so to speak. Because, you know, they're not letting me, you, and average Joe get filthy rich. And the people that are celebrities, 
Bohemian Grove, and they're in the, these, um, you know, different religions, but they're all kind of in the same place. Yeah. 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 Ye
It's to protect the people around you. So stop being so arrogant that you think you're so special that you don't need to care about the guy next to you. I'm passing the baton. Sorry, I had to get that out. I'm venting. And and I want to say this, today's totals globally in death uh, from COVID is 500,000 people. So all of you saying that this isn't any worse than the flu, go stuff it. (laughs) Yeah, go stuff it. I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, I, listen, you know, if, 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 listen, if you if you want to if you want to die, you don't have to kill other people. And if you die, we still love you and forgive you and rest in peace. Yeah, yeah. Well, it does seem very suicidal. I was reading uh, an article where, you know, they all come in my um, inbox when I wake up. It's like, bang, 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 bang. And, you know, the world's been busy writing articles, and I wake up. Over here, six hours behind. And this this man, you know, uh, he defied everything. His daughter's saying, you know, Dad, you're gonna die. And then he uh, he had uh, he's compromised. His immune system or he had pre uh, conditions, and uh, his dad just re- her dad just refused to wear a mask, and then he caught it. And these and these people, when they catch it, a lot of them. You know, we, we think in terms of, oh, you'll get it and you have this time. No, they don't have much time. You know, they're, they're dead no. in uh, 10 days, right? They're in the hospital. Yeah. They have advice. They get dropped off at the door. The family's not allowed in. They try to Facebook, FaceTime, and, you know, do all this uh, with phones. But, um, you know, there's just a, a day you call in and, and they could be fine in the morning. And you call in, and they're, they've got the, uh, what do you call it, when they put the tube down, and they're, and they're gone. And not many of them come off of that. Some of them have. Even people over 100 have survived. But we don't know why one person lives and the other person dies. We don't know. We don't have that information yet. So, so it was very sad for the daughter. And she was angry at her father. And it's not how you want to pass you know, from this planet. And it was totally preventable. So what is that, Dr. Lesson, who is a psychotherapist? What is it that people that are acting so suicidal? Uh, obviously, we ha- it's part of, uh, part of the uh, Republican cult uh, to be like the president. And this is the... Uh, it, it's it's a suicide cult like Jim Jones and drink the Kool Aid and take uh, hydrochloric you whatever the whatever the uh, 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 medicine that the, the president was suggesting. Uh, it, 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 people who are choosing uh, to uh, die, uh, uh, we we need to bless them and not be, ang- be angry at them. But and I do think we need have every right to demand that they not infect other people. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. Uh, it, it, but it's also a blessing to be able to not have to interact with people <laughs> and to be able to follow your rhythm, contact and withdrawal. You need to interact with other people to get stimuli, and there's lots of ways you can do it. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. And there's withdrawal where you stop interacting with other people and go inward and, and reflect. And those are both part of the natural rhythm of life. And I personally have found this really just lovely. I get to spend so much time with my very favorite person in the whole world and uh, a few other people now and then. But it's great. Jen and I get to hang out a lot. And we, we're with our cats. They're very interesting little fur people. <laughs> but, okay, but let's look at this one step. So it, it's not that they are happy with just suiciding themselves, but they want to take people with them. So these people that are going out and they know, they know, we've been doing this for six months now, they know full well that they're going to go out and get infected and infect other people and a certain percentage of those are going to die. It's like 
There are a bunch of suicides no. there, and they've got the COVID bomb strapped on their chest, and they're going to go and breathe all everybody and, and explode it. And, um, you know, it, it, they have these demonstrations on how this passes around. And right now we're seeing the, the end of this demonstration. <laughs> it takes, what, 14 days, and then people start dying. And we, every day, yeah. we said 500,000. Dr. Lesson, do you have any idea what goes into the psyche of a suicide bomber? <laughs> I like that one. Um, well, it depends. The, the jihadists uh, have a belief that, if, you know, like when a Palestinian girl runs into an Israeli girl on the street of Jerusalem, uh, they have the, uh, uh, that they, they feel like they're uh, trying to give the, a home to their people, believe it or not. That is really what they believe. And the boys that die, I uh, think they get all these virgins when they die, if they believe the jihadist stuff. And I don't know where they get all these virgins. That's another problem. But in any case, uh, <laughs> I don't think there is such a thing as a virgin in, in that part of the world. But in any case, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a uh, disrespect for your own life if you take another person's life. And you really, if you're really going to look at things seriously, uh, you know, what, you know, what does being in the military mean? It means you're getting paid to kill people you don't know, uh, orders of somebody who you don't understand who's following somebody else's orders, and you kill people. And and you, if you start being honest about stuff, you'll see that it comes down to, to the degree that you disregard other people's consciousness. You're not respecting your own. If you kill somebody, you are haunted uh, in this lifetime uh, and uh, by the persons you kill. I've worked with so many vets. It's different when if there, there's some kind of honorable uh, battle, but when you're doing some terrible thing like bombing and the other person doesn't have a chance, these people are haunted and haunted and haunted. Uh, war is the stupidest uh, a form of uh, slavery there is. Perhaps. They're all stupid. Debt slavery also drives people crazy. That's a type of slavery, too. Uh, Nanar, before he decided on uh, becoming uh, Allah and doing uh, kill people, he tried to do it with credit. He's, I'll get everybody to be indebted to everybody else, and nobody will want to kill everybody else because they all need everybody else. That was, that was his idea. Uh, it didn't work because uh, Marduk would, it was always willing to go to war and kill people. So yeah, Allah started uh, uh, killing people, too. Uh, but it's all dumb, and it's all based on lack of empathy. And when you're not empathizing with another, any other people, that means you're not honoring your own vulnerability. Sasha, what do you think prevents people from being empathetic to others? I think that they've developed a strategy uh, to survive in a, a very difficult uh, uh, growing up situation where they were loved, and so in order to survive, they, uh, there's many, many tactics. One tactic for a boy is to be aggressive. Another one is to be a, a wimpy victim. Another one is to be spiritual. Another one is to space out. Another one that's very common uh, uh, is to move into your intellect. So instead of feeling life, you think life. Uh, and, and so it, it's very variable uh, what, uh, the, what uh, these different subpersonalities are. But in a person who reflects, they inevitably find that their defensive personalities, which is what they attack other people for exhibiting, uh, are really just their own defenses against the vulnerability, the feeling of I'm not being loved. And being loved when you're very small comes in very specific ways. When your mother's pregnant with you, being loved means that she isn't upset, that she doesn't drink alcohol, that she doesn't smoke, that she doesn't let anyone hit her. Uh, and what it means when you're very, very little, it means that your bottom's dry and that 
you're fed when you're hung when you're hungry and that you have people that touch and interact with you and when you're a little bit older it means that your parents answer your questions as best they can and help you develop your intellect that they encourage you to be yourself in your own direction at your own pace and not push you into being something else that's love and if you're if you don't get that love you do you split because you need your parents you're dependent on you bonded with them and it, and it breaks your little uh, psyche and you then become a defensive person and your defensiveness can take all kinds of forms and if you ha uh, you can always be corrected if you have uh, somebody to help you reflect or you go on a mountaintop and, and take some peyote uh, yeah, whatever your <laughs> method is you could you, you, you get over it but that's how the defensiveness comes. And underneath those defensive people, they're scared little kids, hurt little kids, magic kids that would just love to come out and play with you if you just know how to reach them and not reject them just because they seem so different and obnoxious. And that ties into this new book by Mary Trump that's coming out on the 14th of July, uh, Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man. And so let me just read an excerpt from here. Um, that the Fred, Fred Trump, Fred is uh, Donald's father and Mary's grandfather, um, the family ethos was cheating as a way of life, as a way of life, and they looked at the rest of humanity as monetary pieces. There are stories of Trump and his family sending off the wayward alcohol addicted son Donald's older brother Fred Jr to the hospital alone on the night he died from a heart attack. Um, he died at the age of 42. And let's see, so what, if you go back in time, Donald Trump uh, could not pass his SATs. Um, his, one of his teachers said, Wharton's, uh, Professor at Wharton, William T. Kelly said that Donald Trump was the dumbest goddamn stuber, student I ever had. So there was something going on because of probably abuse, because abuse uh, adds to your and takes away from your IQ. And so, well, it was his father was very abusive. When you get into that book, that's the one thing that comes out of it is that father was very abusive to everyone in the family, including his wife. Right. So, uh, so what Mary says. Uh, Mary's opinion is that Donald's ability to be successful with his father, Fred, who, if you don't know, was a terror of a human being by most every count, uh, according to Mary, Donald's success was simply based on the fact that he was mediocre enough and sociopathic enough to fit into his father's plans. The only reason Donald escaped the same fate uh, that his personality served his father's purpose, uh, you know, same fate as his his older brother who died at 42. And that's what sociopaths do. They co-opt others and use them towards their own ends, ruthlessly and efficiently, with no tolerance for dissent or resistance. And Mary was, is a, an actual clinical psychologist. And she explains that while her uncle has all the clinical traits of someone with narcissistic personality disorder, he was, he's even more troubled to, than that and a comprehensive breakdown of his mental health landscape would be virtually impossible to achieve. So, wow. I mean, this, uh, when I, the book, I pre ordered the book, we're going to do a show on this. So I think this is uh, sociopathy, psychopathy, goes back in time to the Anunnaki and is a trait that is, uh, can be nurtured and fostered through the previous generation, the people that are taking care of someone, and it, it seems to be not necessarily genetic, but it's environmental. It's by who raised you, and they create this uh, succession of uh, personalities that are sociopathic, narcissistic, and psychopathic. And okay, we have we have about what seven minutes left. Sasha, what do you know about sociopaths, psychopaths, and narcissistic personality disorder? Um, I find it um, very limiting to apply labels uh, to, to people that I deal with. I'd rather deal with the uh, reality of the person as they change before me than to diagnose them and regard them as 
uh, as being uh, this or that. And in a way, you can even see that in, in a very useful, useful motive, uh, movement, the, the AA movement, when people begin with, uh, I, my name is Sally and I'm an alcoholic. And it's, it's hard for them to ever be anything but an alcoholic as long as they define themselves. In, in psychology, once you've uh, come a, a little bit of a way, you say, uh, if your name's Sally, you say, hey, don't say it if you're not Sally. But my name's Sally, and I have several um, aspects. One of them is the part of me that likes substances and behaviors that can alleviate my anxiety. I call it my uh, inner addict, but addict's a pejorative term, so I'll just call it my inner uh, uh, comforter. And, uh, and uh, I, the, the inner comforter comes in. Uh, when I need to deal with some anxiety, and I have uh, found other ways to, to uh, use candy when I was a kid, but now all I have to do is uh, do five push-ups or say the Lord's Prayer or, or, or stand on my head. It doesn't matter what it is, but I do something to slow my, me down and so that I can reflect and say I've been destabilized. I've gone into a bonding pattern where I'm uh, uh, attacking or retreating from somebody, and uh, that means my vulnerability has been touched off, and I really need to look at that. And if I could talk from my vulnerability, I won't get in these contretemps with other people, uh, but we can, we, can, we can care about each other more easily if I share uh, how I feel uh, hurt or frightened uh, by what's going on, even if that's an irrational fear. Once I start uh, sharing that, and once I, uh, other people start sharing that with, uh, with me, we can be friends. So, Sasha, looking at the way our country is so divided, what do you think we could do collectively as a people to try and bring it back together? Something an individual could do just day to day to try and get the other side to hear each other. You know, we, we, we to I, listen, not just hear, but listen. I think that that's a, that's a really good idea. After the Watts riots, uh, the, us UCLA students went down, we joined a, a, a community, and we, we just sat there and we listened to the people in Watts about what was going on, and we learned stuff, and we learned how we could help. And I think that it's, it's a time for us to uh, ask the, the Native American people and the, uh, and, and the people that uh, are living in the difficult conditions uh, uh, what's going on from their perspective and what they, uh, how they would uh, like us to interact. I think that's the first step, to, to recognize them, to get, say it's okay for you people to be angry. Uh, you can even think of us as representatives of uh, of, of the uh, Howleys, uh, if, if you want to, and express your anger because we'll we'll take it because we know that you have underneath that anger you are motivated to make the situation better. And so, I, uh, uh, being angry is part of your a very uh, a good healthy part of your process. And I want to provide a, a, a container for you to express that anger and uh, and tell me when you you know. And, and as we progress, I'll find out. You know how it's built, and 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 what can, and what alternate scenarios we can co-create uh, to uh, get you what you really need. That's fueling that anger, and it's and so that's the beginning to talk. Uh, and uh, the way to start almost anything like this, even to mediate a war, is called unilateral giving, giving uh, without asking anything in demand. Uh, so that uh, you know, for example, if I were the the king of Israel, I would say. Rather, let's hey, let's not fight over pal uh, over over uh, the, the the temple and everything. Let's make it international. Everybody in the world can enjoy this place. Uh, and let's uh, you know, and, and 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 we're not asking anything in return. This is our gift to the world, uh, and, and that's a way to start. When uh, the American and Soviet troops were facing each other on a line, and, and uh, 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 Kennedy said, "Pull back five miles," and pull back. And the Russians were looking like they were the aggressors. Then pretty soon they got the orders, pull back uh, five miles, too. And they, you can de-escalate by uh, starting by giving. That's how to start. So, Great answer. I like that. So, yes. <laughs> so I was at a Truth and Reconciliation event with Marianne Williamson. And it was uh, here in Maui, and she had everybody stand facing someone of a different race and culture. 
and we all apologized to each other. But it started with the, the white people, and it was just the most powerful and profound exercise I've ever participated in. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. So something like that, we'll think about this, and, but something like that has to happen. Because right now, too many people are hurting, too many people are dying, and a lot of it is about racism, which started with the Anunnaki 300,000 years ago. Okay, final words to Deborah. Take us on out. Just be kind to each other is the best thing I can say. Yes. And how, how are we Good night, everybody. Kind? How can we be kind? Random acts of kindness. Right? When you see someone in need, answer that need. Don't ask questions. Great. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. We really enjoyed spending time with you. And this is Planetary Puja.